am happy to present you, sir, with the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, in this university, together with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining. I congratulate you, sir. Thank you, sir. The colossal expenditure of energy and resources on armaments, that is an outstanding feature of many national budgets today, does not solve the problem of world peace. Perhaps even a fraction of that outlay in other ways and for other purposes will provide a no more enduring basis for peace and happiness. Thinking of war yes. and preparing for war, if one wants peace, one must think of peace and prepare for peace instead of thinking constantly of war and preparing for it. Let us take uh, disarmament. I realize that no country, as I know them, can afford, because of love of humanity, to disarm by itself, trusting to others. I appreciate that. Politically, a politician cannot be that form. The same might. A politician can't. Although, at the back of my mind, I have an idea that if a country was strong enough and brave enough to do that, it could revolutionize international politics of other countries. <laughs> The year was 1958, and Mr. Nehru spoke those words to me in this very room, which at the time was the Prime Minister's residence. I'm Arnold Michaelis, and I would like to bring 1958 up to the present, because the spirit of Jawaharlal Nehru remains with us and grows in stature with each passing year. I made the trip from New York to New Delhi at Mr. Nehru's invitation. It was a supreme moment in my life. I came not so much to interview the Prime Minister of India as to talk with Nehru, the man. Through our conversation, I discovered the range of his intellect, the quality of his humanity, and the depth of his humor, all of which have had a lasting influence upon my life. In many quarters of the world, he has been characterized as everything from a saint to a devil. He was not a devil. One could question his judgment, but never his motive. He was not a saint, but he was a warm-hearted, deeply feeling human being who cared about his fellow human beings. Some months before I arrived in New Delhi, Mr. Nehru, after having served 11 years as Prime Minister, tried to retire from office, but was emphatically turned down. The country insisted it needed him. I wondered whether he was going to try again. To retire? I'm not thinking of that. That kind of activity. Well, no, not an activity that I accept. And I, when I talk about the time, it has nothing to do with retirement from activity, public activity. But I did think, I do think, that it would be good for me and good for the country for us to, to have a respect from each other. In office, if I left the office of Prime Minister, that of course would be behind that time it takes so objectively the breaking of conceit. Because I know, even if I'm not Prime Minister, I'm very important still in India. <laughs> <laughs> this was the question I raised. Yes. That the, the, the manner of Nehru, yes. the, 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 the atmosphere of Nehru, must remain what it is in India, regardless of any official change of office. And you're aware of that. Yes. When you were supposed to stand for re-election as President of Congress, mm. and uh, apparently uh, you weren't too anxious to stand for re-election at that point. And, uh, you wrote an article, uh, I believe it was for the review, of, for the Modern Review in Calcutta. No one knew that you had written it. It was completely anonymous. But uh, to me, it points out your really tremendous gift for humor, as well as your capacity for satire. And this is what it says in part. Hail Jawaharlal. For nearly two years now, he has been President of Congress. Steadily and persistently, he goes on in 
increasing his personal prestige and influence, like some triumphant Caesar, leaving a trail of glory and a legend behind him. Men like Jawaharlal, with all their great capacity for great and good work, are unsafe in a democracy. He calls himself a democrat and a socialist, and no doubt he does so in all earnestness. But a little twist, and he might turn into a dictator. Jawaharlal cannot become a fascist. He is too much of an aristocrat for the crudity and vulgarity of fascism. His very face and voice tells us that, and yet he has all the makings of a dictator in him. Vast popularity, a strong will, energy, pride. And with all his love for the crowd, an intolerance of others, and a certain contempt for the weak and inefficient. His flashes of temper are well known. His overwhelming desire is to get things done, to sweep away what he dislikes and build anew will hardly brook for long the slow processes of democracy. His conceit is already formidable. It must be checked. We want no Caesars. Well, if you ever really wanted to run for office, I'm sure that you wouldn't want to oppose yourself. <laughs> what I do then was, it's really a, a humorous piece that I wrote. Hardly serious. Oh, but it's such biting satire. But, but at the same time, with, uh, uh, how shall I put it, not what I conceive myself to be holy, but still what might be aspects of my nature, part of, that is, uh, <laughs> of course, a person who could write that about himself, well, he can hardly be what he said I might become. What he suggests he might become. Well, this is why I say I think you're gifted with the greatest amount of objectivity. Yes. You must, in, in, in order to set up that image of yourself, didn't you find some aspect of yourself irritated by what you had said about these tendencies? Even and that's that's irritated? Naturally, otherwise I, I send this to a friend with no idea at hand with and I didn't even get it typed or anything. And it's that friend who, without uh, really asking me, and anonymously, she also sent it to the Modern Review. <laughs> and it was very amusing. When it came out in the Modern Review, I watched the effect of it on others. They were not particularly uh, they, uh, pay much attention to all that I said about myself. They came to the conclusion that this had been written naturally by some opponent of <laughs> <laughs> and I was with you to lessen my chances for the election to the Congress presidency. It was highly amusing. In fact, I remember the matter being mentioned to Mr. Gandhi, who was in Calcutta then. <laughs> I remained mum. I didn't You didn't tell him that you were written? No, not then. Months afterwards, I told him, three or four months after. Yes. But was he amused when you told him? Yes, of course he was amused. But oddly enough, one of the very, very few persons who guessed it was my daughter. She didn't know, I didn't tell her, till later. My, just she guessed it, she knows me well enough, I <laughs> Your writing style? Not only style, but uh, that mood, that approach. <laughs> just how well that Indira Gandhi knew her father came up during a conversation I had with her at the Prime Minister's cottage in 1976. She had characterized her father as a saint and not a politician in the least. I wondered exactly what she meant by that. You characterized your father as a saint and not a politician in the least. In retrospect, do you still feel that way? It just depends what you mean by politician, but I certainly think that he didn't conform to the, the ordinary conception of a politician. You and your aunt both seem to feel that he was inclined to be too much of a Democrat. I think he was uh, too trusting, shall I say. Your sister says that at one moment she feels she's talking to her brother, and the next moment to the Prime Minister. And the third moment probably to some, some, some stranger that <laughs> in. Are you conscious of shifting into all these changes? I'm conscious of one thing. My mind, when I'm talking to a person, unless I'm 
a really interest in that talk, he suddenly finds that other person that has gone away, and might have gone away somewhere else, mm-hmm. if he's watchful. Yes. And thinking of something else, really. I may be half, half following what he says, but I'm really somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> and you make reference to the fact that whenever you were bored, you resorted to your favorite remedy for bottom, standing on your head. <laughs> it's a good thing, standing on the head. What does it do? I've never done it. I, I, <clears throat> I don't know what it does, but it certainly tones up the body, I think. Nerves, especially. Mm-hmm. Well, does it give the impression of the upside-down world being right <laughs> when you stand in your <laughs> Well, not quite, but it does tone up the body, I think. <laughs> Mr. Nehru's main concern was the terrifying destructive power of the hydrogen bomb. The hydrogen bomb is a new weapon of unprecedented power, both in volume and in intensity, with unascertained and probably unascertainable range of destructive potential in respect of time and space. This use threatens the existence of man and civilization as we know it. In the mid-1950s, Mr. Nehru had written a letter which he circulated to many of his friends, explaining his position about problems not only in India, but throughout the world. One of the main points that he made referred to the mental conflicts which accompany great ages of transition. I asked him what he thought was the specific quality of the age of transition during the 1940s and the 1950s. Well, I should say the specific quality is what I've said that letter, that man's material advance, his conquest of the powers of nature, has far outrun his conquest over himself. Yes. And therefore there is this hiatus, a lack of equilibrium, and uh, problems arise unless that is bridged. Of course, the perfect equilibrium doesn't exist anywhere, and I don't suppose it exists at any time. But the gap today is very big and becomes bigger because of the pace of technological advance when more power comes. And the wisdom to use that power right may not follow. It does not follow, as a matter of fact. Well, then we need schools of introspection as well as schools of science. Is that your point? Uh, we call it schools of introspection, or whatever the method may be. But we certainly need a great deal of quiet thinking. Even the fact of drawing yourself away for a little while from ceaseless external activity, give your mind a little rest to think. Even that is helpful. Well now classically, hasn't that been reserved by men of religion? Religion, yes. But then religion also has uh, diverted the mind into rigid channels. Rather opposed to that spirit of free inquiry, which science is supposed to encourage. Yes. The right thing, of course, is for an individual to seek the truth, to try to find it, regardless of consequences. It may be, it may, it may hurt the truth, <laughs> but it does. <laughs> but the truth doesn't cease to be a truth uh, because you shut your eyes to it, because you turn away from it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not. <laughs> It comes uh, with a bang later. Well, of course, I've been very much interested in the points that you make about the conflict in your mind between the term religion and the term spirituality, which in the minds of most churchmen are one. But you do make the distinction, and that interests me a great deal. Yes, religion should include, of course, spirituality. Uh, religion also becomes institutionalized with rigid form, rigid dogma. I don't consider them spiritual at all. Yes. They may be good or bad, but it doesn't matter. But they, 
they are restricted and they give a certain rigidity to a person's mind. Now mind you, religion may help a person. I mean, rigid forms of belief may help a person in the sense that uh, they give a little comfort, they suppress doubts. You can't, responsibility you put on somebody else, therefore. But uh, any rigidity prevents growth, mental growth, spiritual growth, and all that. So, in so far as religion becomes too much attached to institutions and rigid dogmas, there is danger of the element of spirituality becoming less. And then you also go on to say that you feel that religion, orthodox religion that is, has a tendency to make a person more interested in his own salvation rather than in the good of society. Yes, that is so everywhere, I suppose, but more so, I think, in India than elsewhere. Why is that? Well, the whole basis of India, Indian thought, has been rather individualistic. The individual uh, seeking salvation by doing good works, mm -hmm. certainly, yeah. by engaging in good works in society, but seeking salvation for himself. Yes. That, that has been the basis, of course. Read the story of Buddha. Buddha at the last moment refuses salvation. Personal salvation. Personal. He says, no. I'd rather remain and serve uh, people mm -hmm. or the world than merge myself by, by salvation into something else. But must the two be mutually exclusive? No, no, no. They are not exclusive. And I don't know. I'm not competent to talk about this. But uh, the whole idea of salvation in India based on the thought of a, what shall I say, of the divine element being present everywhere. Not only a human being, but an animal or a stone or a tree has something of the divine in it. I realize that this, this kind, the pursuit of this reasoning, even in your letter, caused you to, to ask, rhetorically of course, but caused you to ask the question, what is the meaning of life? Well, listen, every sensitive person in considering a problem is ultimately driven to that. Yes. What is the meaning of my life, any life? What is the purpose of it? Uh, well, an answer to this is frightfully difficult. But to this extent, that unless a person has uh, well, some sense of mission, mission is a big word, Yes. but uh, something, some function, let us say. Life becomes just a, cease, a round of trivialities. For Mr. Nehru, there were few trivialities. His curiosity and boyish enthusiasm gave sparkle to most moments of his life. <laughs>
to the action of individuals in a society. Don't you think that, that in a well, sense... Well, communism came into the picture as rather, when I say communism, please remember it has nothing to do with the Communist Party. They have nothing to do with the Soviet Union do with any, as such. It is only an attempt at a scientific understanding of social forces. So I was attracted to this theory, originally Marxian theory, broadly because it seemed to make me understand the processes of history more. Mm -hmm. I didn't accept everything that he said. He was no dogma for me. No, well, you don't. You don't accept dogma or anything. No, anything. It was nothing. And something seemed to me out of date what he had said yes. even then, and more so now. Mm -hmm. But there was that approach, and uh, uh, some kind of an explanation of this uh, dynamic of history. That was what interested. Yes. yes. You went on further to suggest in this article, Mr. Nehru, that democracy and socialism are means to an end, that they're not the end itself. Well, yes, the end is the development of the individual and the group. Of the individual, I would say, principally, in a group. We can't do, I don't think you can develop a group unless the individual, ultimately, unless the individual also develops. Well, then don't we live with the means constantly and perhaps never achieve the end? Yes, but we go towards the end. In fact, the end always recedes. From us? Yes. Well, because there's no end, final end. If you reach one stage of the journey, immediately there's the next stage. <laughs> well, then actually, this is the problem with the current brand of what we understand to be communism. Isn't it? And it's been politically implemented. Yes, yes, yes. That is, there is too much suppression of the individual and too close, uh, well, uh, an alliance, if you like, with violent methods. Of course, there are violent methods uh, uh, quite outside communism, quite, quite a lot of them too. <laughs> of course. But there is that. And, uh, Ultimately, I think they have bad results. There's one thing which I think I've said in that note, talking about Soviet Union, that by the mere processes of uh, working as they have done, they have to have large-scale education, a very good education. That is a liberating factor again. It won't uproot the Soviet state. It will change their thinking, and uh, as to some extent, it has changed. And uh, make them think less on those rigid lines as they used to. Mm -hmm. uh, because ultimately, education on right lines is the biggest liberating factor of a man. Of course. When Mr. Never expressed these views to me in 1958, they were met with disdain in much of the West. Simple-minded, naive, and quixotic were some of the epithets used to characterize his thinking about the Soviet Union as well as disarmament. He was then viewed as a prophet without honor in much of the world. Now the world should honor his vision. We talk of the good of society and uh, the necessity for uplifting the individual. Whereas in this particular day and age, the individual seems to be lost in the mass speak in terms of mass figures. Uh, people in the West refer to India and China as having teeming millions. It, it seems to me that this emphasis on the mass takes away from the value of the individual. We see two and a half, a mass of two and a half billion people. Don't you think what we have to do if we have the mental elasticity is to see instead two and a half billion individual worlds? I often said, when asked, well, how many problems have you got in India? My aunt, there have been 370 million problems, <laughs> which is more or less what you have said. Exactly, individual problems. Yes. You go on to make the point, and I think a very good point, that in India today, is, for the most part of the world, there seems to be a, an absence of the old spirit of buoyancy, and instead you have an atmosphere of depression and that one of your colleagues, or close colleagues, suggested that this probably was due to the fact that there seems to be an absence of a philosophy about life. Yes. 
Well, do you find that stronger in India today than ten years ago? Well, ten or eleven years ago, soon after independence, there naturally a tremendous feeling of buoyancy as a result of having achieved something for which we had struggled for generations. The immediate result was great buying, of course. Although even then we had a lot of trouble, as you know, the partition of India and all that was horrible. But when people do not achieve something rapidly again, then there's still frustration. You see, basically, in Europe, Western Europe, in America, the economic revolution preceded the political one. Yes. And thereby, resources were created to satisfy political demands. But you've got the opposite here. It is the opposite here. Yes. We get the political one without the economic <laughs> Which is doing it the harder way. Yes. Well, there's no choice about it, I'm saying. No, of course not. You have to work with what you have at hand. seems to me almost a scientific law, one of physics or chemistry, that what you give, you will receive. If you give hatred, you will get hatred in return. If you give affection, you will get affection. Uh, and so on. You can never, you have to pay for things you get. Pay, not in terms of cash, of course, I will say. No, but in terms of balance. In terms of balances. And uh, you can't, uh, it's, it's a two-way track. Well, Mr. Nehru, does this represent your concept of what we call foreign policy? I should like it to represent it. it. But uh, so many things, national interests, what are supposed to be national interests, pressures, and especially the democratic state, you can't do things which you cannot explain and can get the people to accept. There are limitations. Of course. But basically, that is the concept of having good will and good relations. Mind you, people seem to imagine that if you differ from a person, you must dislike him. Yes. If you if differ from a person. Differ, yes. yes. And you must indeed try to push him out or knock him out. Now, that is a basic error. And what Gandhi succeeded in doing was in holding to something he considered a principle with the amazing strength, not losing, it doesn't matter what happened. And yet being friendly to the man, to the man who was opposing him. Difficult thing to do in this, in this society of ours. Well, it's very difficult to do it perfectly. That is to say, if you hold to a certain policy or truth, hold to it. Nobody asks you to give it up. But uh, do not approach the other country which may be different uh, with, uh, with hostility and ferocity. Because the only result is that the other country approaches you in the same way. That was all right when we carried nightsticks and uh, blunderbusses, but it's hardly suitable to a nuclear society, is it? No, I should say it is more necessary. Yes, it's the more. I'm not saying for the moment that uh, let us take uh, disarmament. I realize that no country, as I know them, can afford, because of love of humanity, to disarm by itself, trusting to others. I appreciate that. Politically, a politician cannot be that forward. A saint might. A politician can't. Although, at the back of my mind, I have an idea that if a country was strong enough and brave enough to do that, it could revolutionize international <laughs> policies of other countries. But who to take the first step? I don't see why you shouldn't uh, approach the other country in a friendly way. I mean, say, uh, you are not disarming, let us say, for the present. But, why threaten the other country? Why frighten the other country? Try to disarm, talk about it, and succeed. You create an atmosphere of friendliness, or at any rate, of lack of hostility. You likened it to the animal. If you approach an animal full of fear, yes, yes. he will sense that fear Absolutely. and then attack you Absolutely. in self-defense. Absolutely. And you are completely right. The, the thing that is uh, the worst thing in the world today is this sense of fear. From fear, nothing good comes. I once said, fear is not a good companion.
Now, I give you a personal experience. I have traveled a fair amount, all kinds of countries. And it has been my good fortune to be welcomed wherever I have gone. Whether it is Western Europe or America or Russia or China or Japan or Africa. And welcome not officially, that of course, but by the people. Yes. Now, inevitably, I have felt warmed up by that welcome. And I reacted in a friendly way to those people, regardless of policy. I gave more stress on the common features than the differences. There were different. And so I created an atmosphere of general friendliness, in spite of the difference of opinion. And in which one could function easily and one could uh, perhaps take step, uh, step by step, one could go in a particular direction of even solving the problems. I would like very much to discuss with you some of your reflections which you wrote while you were in prison, which was published in the form of your autobiography. I realize that a great deal of time has passed between what you had written uh, during that period and today. But it would be most fascinating uh, and interesting to discuss with you what your reflexes and attitudes might be now in the light of the experiences that you've had since becoming Prime Minister. As I wrote this book a quarter of a century ago now, it seems very familiar and yet distant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that conflict runs through, even your appraisal of yourself. Yes. You said I became a, a queer mixture of the East and the West, out of place everywhere, at home, nowhere. That's a very poignant statement for a man to write about himself. I have a feeling of spiritual loneliness, not only in public activities, but in life itself. Now, obviously, that was true then. That was the way you felt then. Does that have any relation to the way you feel today? Well, yes, to some extent. Not in one's work so much, because one is absorbed in one's work. But outside that work, that feeling creeps upon one. Spiritual loneliness. Yes. Do you find that it's difficult to establish, shall we say, spiritual rapport with other people, with your associates, with your friends? There is rapport in a particular phase of activity or department of life. There's, there may be complete rapport in that, in which I'm working with them. Yes. And they may not be in another aspect of oneself. This kind of 100% rapport is very difficult to find anywhere. I suppose, between individuals. Yes, of course. It's a percentage. Well, then you still do feel a sense of spiritual loneliness. Yes, certainly I feel it. I'm sad. I don't mean to say that I'm always feeling it or feeling frustrated. Not that. I'm not a person who's... Well, uh, I'm not a frustrated person at all. You don't give that impression. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling of, a, if I may say so, of a certain satisfaction with the opportunities I have had in life. And uh, so I have no sense of frustration, but uh, undoubtedly there is a feeling of loneliness which creeps upon one. I had always thought that that would be rather normal, almost, that feeling, for many people who are sensitive. And uh, it's a curious thing how in the middle of a crowd, I am one of the crowds and get apart from it. Well, that's another part of this conflict that you've developed down through the years. But getting back to the queer mixture, as you refer to yourself, as being the queer mixture of the East and West, out of place everywhere, at home nowhere, do you feel that today? It's difficult to say. One has that feeling sometimes. On the other hand, there's a counterpart of that, of being at home everywhere to some extent. Nowhere was Mr. Nehru more at home than in the company of children. Their spontaneous joy and enthusiasm ignited his own. His childlike qualities cut through to the heart of every issue. And perhaps minds entrenched in the usual diplomatic niceties found it hard to appreciate his simple clarity. But the passage of time and the succession of events have confirmed his thinking. But you do have, Mr. Nehru, the day that you became Prime Minister. I wonder what your feeling was. I wonder if you can recapture it. The feeling that you had finally succeeded, not in becoming Prime Minister, but in, in, in getting independence for India. And that you had many years ahead of you to see the fruits of all those years of labor. Have you 
seen the little speech I delivered on the on that occasion? I don't recall it. Well, I'll show it to you afterwards. Well, I'd love to see it. Just a small one. We decided to see the change over our cave at midnight. Mm -hmm. I said we met at midnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, just before midnight, all the members took their oath of allegiance to the New India. Of course, there's a feeling of relation, I suppose, a feeling of uh, achievement, but it was tempered by the partition and all that. Although we didn't know all the horror of the partition then, mm -hmm. it came a little later. Yeah. Still, fear that all was not well there. It must be said here that Mr. Nehru reluctantly accepted the partition of India. Philosophically, he was opposed to the partitioning of peoples everywhere, feeling that the world, in fact, had become one. Now, at this point in the filming, both Mr. Nehru and I thought the cameras were turned off and that we had completed the film. So he turned to an assistant and asked that he bring the book that contained the little speech he delivered at the midnight hour signifying India's independence. This is the speech I made at that midnight hour on our Sunday. Oh, please, please, won't you, won't you let, read it to me? Hang up there. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. Mm. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. At the dawn of history, India started on her unending quest, and trackless centuries are filled with her striving, and the grandeur of her success and her failures. Through good and ill fortune alike, she has never lost sight of that quest or forgotten the ideals which gave her strength. We end today a period of ill fortune and India discovers herself again. Before the birth of freedom, we have endured all the pains of labor and our hearts are heavy with the memory of this sorrow. Some of these pains continue even now. Nevertheless, the past is over and it is the future that beckons to us now. That future is not one of ease or resting, but of incessant striving so that we may fulfill the pledges we have so often taken and the one we shall take today. The service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity. The ambition of the greatest man of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That may be beyond us, but as long as there are tears and suffering, so long our work will not be over. And so we have to labor and to work, and work hard to give reality to our dreams. Those dreams are for India, but they are also for the world, for all the nations and peoples are too closely knit together today for any one of them to imagine that it can live apart. Peace has been said to be indivisible, so is freedom, so is prosperity now, and so, also, so is disaster in this one world that can no longer be split into isolated fragments. To the people of India, whose representatives we are, we make it appeal to join us with faith and confidence in this great adventure. This is no time for petty and destructive criticism, no time for ill will or blaming others. We have to build the noble mansion of free India, where all her children may dwell. <laughs>